mighty rap, your hands around my waist. And bury your first in the ground while you decide. Welcome back to another episode of the Psycho Podcast. I'm your host, Margot Underwood, and this is a place where I have the pleasure of interviewing specialists, authors, doctors, psychologists on the topics of human sexuality. This is a place where we break stigmas and bust hymens, deconstruct taboos, initiate more self-pleasure in our lives, expose alternative therapies to approach these sensitive topics. Thanks for joining me here. Welcome back to another episode. I'm happy to have you. Today, we are gonna talk about something that is very near and dear to both mine and Dr. Daryl Ray's heart, and that is the world of BDSM. Underneath the BDSM umbrella, there are a lot of topics that need to be covered, and in this episode, we cover first, the origins of our kinks the structure of our sexuality and how that comes to fruition in the first place. Kind of segue into other topics like ethics, protocols, contracts, um, BDSM as a non-therapeutic practice, but something that can be cathartic at the same time. So if you have missed previous episodes with Dr. Daryl Ray, He is the founder of recoveringfromreligion.org as well as the Secular Therapy Project. He wrote books on uh, sex and religion called The God Virus as well as Sex and God. Uh, He's just a unique person and I am so happy to have him on. Um, If you want to see more of him, check out the links in the bio. Uh, But right now we're going to jump straight into the episode. I am so glad to have you back Um, and talking about something that we both are very passionate about. And for one thing, I definitely want to go into research in BDSM eventually. Um, But it was the our preliminary phone call where you had mentioned that you were uh, into BDSM and power dynamics um, upon like our first conversation. And I was like, oh my God, I just kind of, <laughs> I needed to know more. <laughs> um, it's just, it's so fun finding, um, uh, <clears throat> personally finding like older people that are into it because you probably have seen the scene change and the lifestyle change over time. And I'm always fascinated about those, the nuances and the changes. So we are going to kind of jump into that today. Okay, Um, great. Yeah. Uh, So I guess first question um, is kind of why do you think someone might come across BDSM in the first place? Uh, What attracts them to it um, initially? And I'm sure this answer varies widely, but coming from a, a psychological point of view, I'm interested. I I think that's the $64,000 question. I don't think anybody (laughs) knows for sure, but I think we have some pretty good hints and some, some direction around where the evidence uh, might, might lead us. I, I can use my own, I'll just I'll use my own uh, life as an example, but I don't, I'm not saying my life is the example for everybody. But I, I have met many people who realized and recognized their kink or a kink or a proclivity towards certain kinds of, well, what most people would call non-traditional, non-vanilla kind of sex mm-hmm. or, or sexual expression. And they realized it when they were five years old, when they were 10 years old, when they were 14 years old. I mean, there's early, early, early in life, we are being exposed to things that we have no control over. We don't understand. We don't know within our environment. And we're also internally 
our bodies are changing and hormones are flowing. And there's, there's a lot of interesting biological things happening. And then you add to that something I think fascinating, and that is there's cultural stuff going on that we're not aware of at all. Mm. And cultures, cultures have a tremendous power to shape our behavior. Uh, mm -hmm. And I can give you some examples that aren't BDSM related necessarily, but they have tremendous power to shape our behavior way beyond our consciousness. For mm -hmm. example, <laughs> first time I went to Wales, um, United Kingdom, years ago, I was there actually for the purposes of work, but I stayed for another two weeks and vacationed. And as I'm traveling around, I'm noticing something really interesting about North Wales. And that is a surprisingly large number of women there have very large breasts. I mean, it is like for a, you know, for a breast guy like me, it was heaven. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So you got to ask the question, why there? I mean, we could go to Scotland and it wouldn't be as bad. We could go to Netherlands and wouldn't see much. You go to Japan and you can't find breasts anywhere, hardly. In right. fact, there's special kinks around Japanese big-breasted women because they're, they are really rare. Mm -hmm. So how did that happen? There's a evolutionary process going on there. Mm -hmm. And it's selective. It's sexual selection. Women with larger breasts seem to be reproducing at a higher rate of women that have smaller breasts. Well, then you go down to southern, uh, south, um, central Africa, and you, you see there are tribes and, and peoples in south central Africa that, that have something called steopigia. And steopigia is big butts. I mean, mm -hmm. And these are women with enormous butts. And in that culture, that is seen as incredibly attractive. Mm -hmm. uh, th there's even some novels. Uh, the um, uh, There's a novel written by a, I can't remember, about a de woman detective in Botswana who has steopigia. Now, steopigia is not a disease. It's, it's no different than big breasts. It's just big butt. But right. you know some women that have enormous butts, and you've seen pictures of African women with enormous butts, mm -hmm. why why are they in that culture? Because you can go 100 miles up the road to a different tribe and they don't have big butts. And it's because, again, we're selectively, we're selectively breeding ourselves. Mm -hmm. Humans breed animals, we breed cows, we breed dogs, but we in some ways breed ourselves. And the evidence is right in front of us with, with breasts and and with butts and and maybe with penises too. I mean, why is the penis so large? Human penises are far larger per the size of the males attached to them than mm -hmm. any chimp or any bonobo mm -hmm. or certainly much bigger than a gorilla. I mean, a gorilla's penis isn't isn't any bigger than the tip of my thumb hardly. It's mm -hmm. it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I say all that to say that we are we are under the influence of culture. When we're, a, when we're young children and the culture's doing things to us. For example, um, spanking children. I have known many, many people say that I would get an erection or I would get sexually turned on uh, as a girl when I was being spanked by my dad at five years mm -hmm. old or, or six years old. Well, <laughs> I, I mean, how many people have told you that? <laughs> How many people have I heard this from? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. So here's what's going on. In the human brain, <clears throat> our brains are programmed. Oh, let's go back to uh, an insect. An insect only lives for one, one season, for example. So everything about that insect's reproduction is going to be genetically hardwired in because they have no time to learn, and they don't live inside of a culture. So when the cicada comes out of the ground... They've got like eight days to mate or they're dead. <laughs> and right. uh, so they get the job done and it's all genetically programmed. Well, humans, uh, many mammals are, are close to that, but not completely. I mean, your dog is pretty genetically programmed. The squirrel in the trees outside of my house is pretty genetically programmed, but there's an element of learning there probably. 
Among birds, there's clearly an element of learning because they have to learn the right song or they won't get a mate. So mm -hmm. there's learning around songbirds. Well, humans are just orders of magnitude bigger on that count. We have, we have a very fundamental structure. Think of it as a building. In our brains, we have a building with the... Um, the girders and the, the foundation and, you know, all the stuff mm -hmm. to build the building, it's there, but there's no roof, there's no windows, there's no siding. It's just a, a framework within which we will then create our own sexuality. Mm -hmm. And our brain, as it's developing through those early years, up until about 12 years old, <coughs> has been programmed to, to look around and say, okay, what is the right approach to sex and sexuality in this culture at this time. Mm -hmm. okay. And so a, a five-year-old's brain is looking for what turns him on, what turns her off, what uh, scares them. Mm -hmm. and, and the same thing's happening at 10 years old. And the brain is processing. And so if you're born in a steel pigeon environment in South Central Africa, by the time you're seven or eight years old as a boy, you will have been programmed to think, Big butts are incredibly attractive. Mm -hmm. I got to find a wife and and marry her. Mate. And I don't want any of those uh, any of those thin butt ladies over in the other tribe. I just don't. It's they're not attractive to me. Right. So that's really uh, that's the foundation of everything we're going to talk about here today. Mm -hmm. Is to keep in mind that it's the developmentally the developmental brain is going through processes of trying to understand what that culture requires. They're building, they're putting the windows, they're putting the walls, they're putting the roof on their sexuality during mm -hmm. that time. And the culture is also pushing it. So the culture is saying, you know, these are, these are what's appropriate here and this is what's not appropriate. So you don't even know, you know, why is, why is masturbation wrong? They just, they just tell you that, you know, I right. go to church on Sunday and they tell me I'm going to hell if I go to masturbate. I, I have no clue why that's bad, but, but my body is pushing me to masturbate. My body wants to express itself sexually. My body needs to practice sexuality in some way, or I won't be ready when it's time. <laughs> right. Um, I don't know. I, I'm going, I could go on and on. I, I've got a lot to say about this, Margot. So I don't want to bore you or overwhelm. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not bored. This is a, this is a age old conversation. I think that goes back and forth between the nature ver versus nurture, uh, versus <clears throat> like the creative self kind of building your own interests <clears throat> into the framework. So part of it is genetics. Part of it is your environment. And then part of it is your own, interests, but I can't help but think that those interests are somewhat influenced as well, you know, by your environment. I think those interests are <laughs> deeply influenced. We have no clue. I mean, yeah. you may not remember the spanking you got at five years old. You may not even remember oh, I it. Do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, I do. <laughs> okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> and there, and there probably lies uh, the roots of some of your interest in kink. Uh, it just, <laughs> I, and it's I not, know, yeah. it's not unhealthy. It's, it's not, it has nothing to do with whether you're mentally balanced or mentally ill, nothing. It just, you had, your brain was looking for the ap appropriate ways to express your sexuality. And at that time you got spanked and your body responded because that's the way bodies are going to respond right. to that kind of stimulus. I mean, uh, women, adrenaline, uh, yeah, <clears throat> adrenaline, the, the, the erogenous zone. I mean, the butt mm -hmm. uh, on many, many women is an erogenous zone. I don't know how many women just fucking love to be spanked while they're oh, yeah. being fucked. Yeah. In fact, I've had women tell me, uh, you, you don't like me. You must not be attracted to me if you're not spanking me. It's that simple. Oh, no. <laughs> so, okay, I, we can make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and not only women. I mean, the whole 
chemical process that's happening inside of someone's body when that's happening is just like I could see it across the board. But there are way less men in, you know, in my own experience that um, enjoy different types of pain. Uh, yeah, because the, the, pain, the pain pathways are different. Men and women have different ah. pain pathways. There's the subcutaneous tissue in women is much thicker in the butt, so they can take a lot more pressure, mm. um, hard pressure against without it uh, stimulating the wrong uh, pathways or or the, not the wrong mm -hmm. pathways, but stimulating pathways that are unpleasant. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and who knows how much that culture because if your culture is telling you you should be submissive and you're listening mm -hmm. to that and your brain is looking around saying, oh, all these other people are submissive, maybe I should be. Well, if you're genetically tendent, you have a genetic tendency towards passivity or submission, mm -hmm. that may feel just right to you. And you'll mm -hmm. slip right into being interested in submissive kinds of roles within the BDSM uh, play or, or world. And uh, that'll be, there's nothing wrong with that. That'll, that'll work fine. It's just that your culture actually kind of nudged you in that direction. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about I, nature and nurture, I, I've actually thrown those out. I'm not very interested mm -hmm. in nature and nurture because I think they're pretty useless terms. Mm -hmm. When you think about your brain is, is a framework. That's the genetic part. Mm -hmm. The, the nurture might put some pieces on the table or the color of the glass, but there's a hell of a lot more that has to be put together. And that's mm -hmm. the culture. So you got, you know, culture, nature, nurture, all those things come together. And yeah. Well, when I say culture, I mean, I mean, environment, but environment, environment is, is multi-leveled. I mean, you've got your local environment, which is the family, mm -hmm. your family of origin. And then you've got your local community, which is, mm -hmm. you know, the school you may be in. And then you got the broader culture that you watch mm -hmm. the news media and you find out gay people are being arrested or executed. I mean, all, each level here has got its influence on you. Yeah, absolutely. Globally, yeah. even. Yeah, even globally, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's all really interesting. It's a uh, age old um, discussion and yeah. which is why I really want to go into the research field of it. Start <laughs> pumping out. Well, the research is is, is very difficult. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, I think we've also had the problem, of course, in the States of all our sex negativity. It's hard yeah. to get it's hard to get money. It's hard to get grants to do this kind of research. True. But even if the research money was available, it's hard to tease out these, the roots of, of, of kink, of BDSM, of interest in, because our culture really says, okay, vanilla sex for procreation only. I mean, that's a pretty strong uh, theme in our culture. It comes out of the Catholic and Baptist and you know, all those people doing purity culture. So we're getting that message over here, even as our bodies are developing in a whole different direction. Yeah. And the, when those two clash, I'm just going to tell you, this is the funniest thing. I, I didn't realize this until about, oh, a little over 20 years ago, I started going to kink conferences. I went to my mm -hmm. first kink conference probably about the year 2000 or so. And... Uh, what what blew my mind was the number of people at the conference. I mean, there were like six hundred people there. They you know they uh, they buy the whole hotel. They block it off. There's cops that keep you from coming in if you don't have a ticket. That sort of stuff. It's adults only, of course. Mm -hmm. People walking around with crosses. People walking around with Jesus tattoos. I'm thinking, what's going <laughs> on here? So I, I, of course, being curious. I would ask them. I mean, if I could find a discreet way, I would say, oh, well, sound like uh, what kind of uh, church do you go to? What kind of religion do you practice? Mm -hmm. There are Baptists all over the place. I couldn't believe how many Baptists I found at kink conferences. Mm -hmm. And when you scratch below the surface a little bit, they're really religious over here, but they're practicing their sexuality over here. 
and the two don't seem to meet. Yeah. <laughs> they certainly don't meet at church. <laughs> right. <laughs> but they feel it's, the need to maintain bizarre. that. Yeah, it's like that... Uh... Oh, man. The Madonna complex, kind of, just like keeping Ma- the pure. Madonna whore. The Madonna, Madonna whore, complex. whore complex. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that Madonna whore complex, that's a Catholic complex because you do not okay. find it in Baptists. So I won't, I, I will say that's not what's going on with the Baptists. It's just their ability to uh, compartmentalize their sexuality from their religious religiosity i mean that person's teaching sunday school or Mm -hmm. you know or as an elder in their church oh and they're condemning gays and they're condemning perverts and condemning anybody that doesn't do vanilla even as they you know the cup men women married to each other yeah they're off doing their own thing over here well you saw that in the jerry falwell (laughs) jr thing jerry falwell (laughs) jr seems to be a Voyeur, he likes watching other men fuck his wife. And uh, it, I mean, that all came out this year. He's, he loves sitting in the corner of the room, you know, watching this pool boy have sex with his wife. Uh-huh. <laughs> how, did mean, he, how does he compute? You know, because he never lets those two cross paths inside of his brain. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. That's a, uh, that would like, honestly, I mean, and I've kind of had that. I've done that in my own life where I separated, um, let's say like my professional and my, like my appearance online to separate that from like my, what I'm interested in, which is sexuality. And it created so much anxiety in me of like, oh, someone's going to find out one day and then I'm going to be caught off guard. All these assumptions are going to be made. So coming out essentially about my personal interests to everyone and just being like open and accepting of myself was a huge turning point in my self-confidence and mostly my confidence to just like being okay with what I find interesting. Um, Yeah. uh, So I want to know kind of what, Oh, go ahead. Well, I, I think you're just expressing something that's super, super important, Margo, and that is mm-hmm. learning to just accept who you are and explore. Mm-hmm. Explore who you are. Explore. I mean, you do not know who you are as a sexual being when you're 15 years of age. And yet right. that's the time in which you're forming interests. I, I'll just I'll tell you a story I started to tell earlier and I didn't. I did not realize how interested I was in power exchange and kink until I, uh, my mother and father, of course, dead set against porn and they were very religious and they were in the elders in the church and all. Uh, but you know, I discovered my dad's porn stash and Mm -hmm. he happened to have, uh, he happened to have a, a magazine with a lot of BDSM type scenes in it. I mm-hmm. thought, wow, this is really, really hot. I can sit here as I'm speaking with you and remember the pictures, especially one or two pictures in that magazine, like I saw them yesterday. Mm-hmm. And of course, as my religious dad, and I know my mother had to know because it was in the bottom drawer of their <laughs> mutual dresser. She had to know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so again compartmentalizing, but I can remember at 12, 13 years old, being so incredibly turned on by that. I had never been exposed to that before. I had never had fantasies about that. The, the minute I saw it, it just opened up a whole new world for me. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, I didn't act upon it because I was still too Christian and all that religious guilt stuff. But 20, uh, let's say from, I, I discovered that at 15, or 12 or whatever, and then I become sexually active at 18, 19, 20, at what point beyond that do I start acting on that interest? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what's what's an appropriate time to start acting and all that sort of stuff? Anyway, well, I was going to ask that's, you. That's a bit about my, my back. I wanted to ask you what initially drew you, what initial, what, not even initially, what draws you to power exchanges? Um, personally. 
Well, if I, I'm not sure I have the answer to that question. <laughs> really? I think, uh, no, I don't think anybody really knows. I, I, I am a pretty dominant personality. I've always been pretty dominant. I've always been, uh, I don't know. I didn't set this out. I think it's a lot of genetics here. I mean, I've always been a leader. If, if I'm in a mm -hmm. group, I'm probably going to be the leader. And it's not because I push myself into that role. I'm, I mean, there's groups wanted me to be a leader and I didn't. I left. I don't mm -hmm. want to be your leader. I, you know, that kind of thing. So I just know that I have a tendency towards being liking, liking to be le the leader. Mm -hmm. And in sexuality, I always I, I am always on top. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm not saying I can't enjoy having my partner on top occasionally. It's not that. I mean, I'm always the dominant one in the bedroom, period. Mm -hmm. And if I don't, if my partner needs to switch, they need to go find somebody else to switch mm -hmm. with. I mean, we'll still fuck. Well, I've had many partners where I was the dom over them and they had somebody else that they would dom. I actually had a girlfriend who got into, uh, she kind of did a little bit of amateur uh, stuff and she, uh, she wanted she wanted a safety net around her so she asked me to kind of supervise so I mm -hmm. did and boy she had a great time I mean I have never seen her quite so turned on and mm -hmm. our time together I mean we haven't been together in years but during our time I saw her incredibly turned on by spanking and tying up an, a man and just mm -hmm. torturing the hell out of him <laughs> mm -hmm. of course he was having a lot of fun too <laughs> And, it's very fun. But <laughs> she felt she felt safe because I was there, you know. Yeah. But I'm not submissive to her. I was never. That's just not my nature. Period. Yeah. And I've had people say, "Oh no, everybody should try it once. Everybody should be submissive." That's bullshit. I agree. Some, pe some people are. Some people aren't. Don't force it. It's mm -hmm. it's it's stupid to try and force it. Which leads me. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of other stuff to talk about around that. But why I'm dominant is probably it's probably basic personality that's yeah. probably what it is yeah and and how many people i mean if you look at dominance as a um, bell curve and certain people are going to be at the high end of dominance and other people are going to be real low dominant uh submissive if you will and then there's lots of people in between and i mean lots of people in between mm -hmm. those people are going to be a bit confused in this bdsm world because they don't know which way to go and that's okay that they may be, a, they may identify themselves then as a switch and they like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, on Tuesdays, I like to get my butt beat, but on Wednesdays, I want to be on top and mm -hmm. I want to be the one that's tying somebody up. Um, of course, it's not quite like that Tuesday or Wednesday. Right. But, uh, <laughs> I get what you mean. <laughs> I'm actually, I kind of fall into the switch category because I've always had a really dominant personality, very independent since mm -hmm. forever um but it was i i came into the scene as a submissive and i think a lot of that had cultural influence and it was just mm -hmm. comfortable and then stepping in i stepped into my dominant side like a little like close to about a year ago and a lot of it had to do with kind of like being sick of all of these um, just there's just a lot of characters out there that believe that they're dominant and then they are just they're just mean. And I had had some really mm -hmm. cathartic mm -hmm. experiences and wanted to provide that for other people. Um, and the first time I was so nervous the first time, I don't know why it is such a nerve wracking thing for some people, but I was so nervous my first topping scene, but that quickly shed because I just started getting straight into my, uh, my interests and like what I like, <laughs> I was like, this isn't really uh, about you, you anymore. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so it is still like this foreign field, I think, mostly for women, too, because we are not seen as these dominant creatures. Um, mm -hmm. But it is so liberating and it did so many things for me in terms of 
uh, just my, my self-confidence once again, just being able to yep. speak my needs and allow myself to be taken care of by someone else. Like it's, it's given me a lot of growth, but, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. There's another element that to that. I, what? Well, I think I, I've, you've just articulated something, uh, you know, I, I'm always, whenever I'm around the kink community or people, I'm, I'm always interested i want to know what drives people what's the underlying factors and and i've heard what you just said from many women thing that they didn't even see themselves as switches they saw themselves as submissives mm -hmm. and until they had an opportunity they said well let me try it and they did it and they loved it mm -hmm. there's other women however that were pushed and goaded by their partners into being dom and they mm -hmm. just it never takes, it's not pleasant, they don't like it, it's not a turn on for them. Uh, however, there's a lot of men out there that want to be dominated by a woman mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or want to be dominated. I mean, it could be uh, LGBTQ people as well, it doesn't matter, but they, they want to have someone else dominate them. And there's a there's clearly an imbalance in the world. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a there are very few true dominants, very few. I mean, if you, again, mm -hmm. look at the bell curve. There's there's actually very few true submissives as well. Mm -hmm. So you got these two out on the edges of the bell curve, and if they can meet each other, they're probably gonna have a lot of fun. <laughs> uh -huh. But don't try, don't try to make the, sub, the naturally submissive person be dominant with you, and don't try to uh, make a dominant person switch and test it out because it's probably not going to work for yeah. the two of you. No. If you're in the middle, I've, I've got some friends, they've been together for 15 years, I guess, highly kinky, and they're always switching. Always. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you never know on any given day. You go to a party, you don't know which one's going to be doing what. And maybe they both do both on, they just, and they can smoothly do it because they've learned how to negotiate it. Mm -hmm. They've also learned how to read each other, and uh, they're and they're very safe people. They they mm -hmm. negotiate well, um, that, you know, that sort of stuff. Yeah, I've never just switched with one person before. I'm like typically that kind of person that likes to choose a role in a relationship. I just haven't made that connection yet with someone. I'm sure it's possible, but. Um, I don't know. It's different. I don't, I don't know that it's necessary. I think and this kind of leads to a whole other discussion you can have, uh, and that's around polyamory. Mm -hmm. I think the beautiful thing about, about the BDSM world is there's so much overlap with the polyamory world. There's huge overlap. I, I yeah. would say probably 50% maybe in some cases that I've seen. And if, if that's the case, if you're, if you're – capable, emotionally and intellectually capable of being polyamorous, then you could have a partner where you that beats your butt once a week. Uh, mm -hmm. And you got to have your regular partner that you just have vanilla sex most of the time, you know, or you're submissive to them. You could be, you could have all, you could have your cake and eat it too. It, right. Yeah. yeah. And if, if you've got a partner that respects you and knows you really, really want a certain style or certain aspect of sexuality that they aren't interested in, then you negotiate and go get that need met somewhere else. Absolutely. Yeah. I definitely, I exercise that right all the time. Um, especially when it comes to rope and suspension and stuff, because mm -hmm. you know, it's hard to find, at least where I am, it's hard to find good rope <laughs> tops and um, when I do find one, I want there to be a connection and I need them to know all the theory behind what they're doing. And it's it's rare. But, you know, you can't find that in all your partners and you can't expect your partners to provide all of the kinks that you no. want. I, yeah. I have never been into rope. I use I use rope, but I'm not very good at it. Not interested, really. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want it functionally. <laughs> I want it for yeah. restraint <laughs> or, right. you know, whatever. But I, I just enjoy a, a master of shibari. You know, if I can, 
Right. I just that's just really it's it's fun to watch somebody else enjoying that. I mm-hmm. I had a submissive. We were together for like five years, uh, long distance really, so we didn't see each other a lot. But I took her to a BDSM conference, and she had wanted in the worst way to uh, to ex- experience rope. And she saw a demonstration uh, during the conference. You know, they have different uh, co- um, workshops and stuff. And she saw a demonstration. Um, she turned to me and says, I want that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we found the guy that that evening and uh, and uh, contracted with him to tie her up. Nice. At, at virtually every part of her body, except her pussy and her tits and her feet, uh, had rope. I mean, uh-huh. she was covered, uh, of course, not her head or her neck. And then and then he had ropes, uh, he had a kind of a structure, four, four-legged four structure, and he, he pulled her up with a, you know, suspended her. Right. She, sus- she suspended probably something like 12 inches off the ground, but she can't move a muscle. She is yeah. totally incapacitated. <laughs> and then he says... He turned to me and says, okay, now you can play with her. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. The conduit. Yeah. Oh, he was really good at what he did. Mm-hmm. And he's very kind. He was very gentle, reassuring. Of course, I'm there so she feels safe because mm-hmm. we knew each other really. So I start I start um, playing with her, Clit, and she starts mm-hmm. having an orgasm and she orgasms at orgasms at or I have never seen her she <laughs> orgasm pretty easily but this time it was like over and over and over again uh-huh. after about a half hour of this my fingers getting tired <laughs> mm. <laughs> <I'm> saying, <"Whoa." laughs> yeah and the immobilization said, is amazing it, it was so he finally gently took her down untied her and she was like in la la land for mm-hmm. 24 hours, we got in the car and drove all the way back home, which it was like <laughs> a four hour drive. And she said at the end of that, she said, I've been basically in orgasm for the last 24 hours. That's amazing. So I've never experienced anything like that. So at that moment, I realized I was not aware of I, I just hadn't educated. I hadn't seen it. I had never seen anything like that before. And it was pretty it was pretty educational. Mm-hmm. And pretty gratifying for her, of course. She really, really loved it. Uh, but I, I was never going to su- supply that for her. It's, it's just not an interest of mine. But I was mm-hmm. glad I was able to facilitate that for her. Right. And be a part of it, too. It's, ill. Mm-hmm. I love, I could go, I could do a whole episode on rope. And I, I probably will. <laughs> But uh, let's <laughs> let's talk. Let's go into like uh, the different layers of consent um, when it comes to play, because it's not just like a yes, no, enthusiastic, whatever. I personally feel like there are so many different layers to consent that you have to be aware of, like when it comes mm-hmm. to knowing, you know, how that person's week was what their mental state is, uh, like, can't, even if they do say yes, like, should you be doing it to someone? You know, it's, there's so much yeah. more to consent than what, um, than just the yes, no stuff. So I want to yeah, know kind of your experience on it. Well, I think the vanilla world is pretty lame when it comes to consent. <laughs> I, I don't think the vanilla world knows what the fuck they're doing most of the time. Right. And, <laughs> you know, consent is, consent is either yes or no. Uh, and I just, I just think that's, that's so unsophisticated. It's so unnuanced mm-hmm. that I, it's, that's partly what makes vanilla so uninteresting. It's because there's, there's no third dimension. It's just two dimensional. Right. I see BDSM and, the kink world is a three dimensional. It adds an entire world that to explore that Mm -hmm. I would, I would dare say you will never explore it completely. There's always something new to -hmm. to explore. And I wish I'd have started 20 years earlier. I didn't start. I didn't really, I I played around with kink in my uh, late thirties, early forties but I never really got into it till I was 50 years old. And then I, then I just committed to it. 
but I also committed to polyamory. And when I realized that I almost had to get poly become polyamorous in order to be effectively kink kinky as well, because that's interesting. No one partner was going to satisfy me. Period. Right. Just wasn't going to. And why should I expect it? And it only leads to conflict. There, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it does not. It's not a pleasant thing for either side. And some so, begin, I've I heard, think you're, I think what you just said is go ahead. Oh, no. Um, well, what I was going to say was that I've heard like from so many people, one of my girlfriends actually came over yesterday, brought this up. She was like, let's, you know, let's do all the hard things, BDSM, poly and uh, I can't remember the third part, but come her idea was that when you combine those things, some, it makes things more complex. Um, but you just said you can't, you needed to step into poly in order to be effective in BDSM. And my first introduction to, not really my first, but one of my introductions into BDSM and poly was like, well, you can't be, you know, this Dom was like, well, Dom in quotations was like, you know, you can't have more than one Dom. You can't be, it's hard to be poly and have a power exchange with someone else. And that does not ring true to this day. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's manipulations. What it is. Yeah. I was like, there, um, I don't know. <laughs> what my experience with Doms, there, there's a good little book called The Loving Dom that I think is pretty darn good uh, that I would recommend if we're going to, somebody wants to know what a Dom is. Mm -hmm. But there's so many, mainly, mainly males, I, I won't bullshit you, most of them yeah. who, think, who think they're Dom, mm -hmm. who think they want to be dominant, who think they should... And all they're doing is responding to their cultural programming. They don't have a clue. And they're also, they're also very unsophisticated about their communication skills. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to negotiate. I, I, there's, there's so much. I think, I think that to be an effective Dom, you really, really have to be very self-aware. You mm -hmm. have to know who you are. Early on, it, when I first started practicing my skills as a dom, and when I mean skills, I don't mean flogging. I'm, I'm damn good. I'm a I'm pretty much an expert on Florentine and a few other things that I I really am interested in. Awesome. But what I mean is, when I practice, I mean the psychological component of it. Mm -hmm. When I first started, I realized the over that there was an overwhelming emotional response to the situation, to the interaction, to the power play that I could see could easily get out of control. Easily. Yeah. I, I, I experienced that. I thought, fuck, this is both exhilarating, exciting, and dangerous. Yeah. It could be any of those things. So you have to be self-aware to know, okay, this part is dangerous. Make sure you pay attention to it and keep it under control. But there are so many doms that they don't understand that about themselves. And they think all it is is beating somebody's butt or whipping them or tying them up or calling telling them, them what to names, do. Telling them what to do. And it could be none of those things. Mm -hmm. And it may not be right for that day, for that person. Mm -hmm. You may have done it last week and had fun, but maybe not this week. Mm -hmm. It you it just have to pay attention. And I think a Dom, a really good Dom, reads the sub up to the, the Nats ass. I, I, it takes me about three, three scenes over a period of time, maybe a, a few weeks or months with, with a submissive to just to read her body to, mm -hmm. to know, I only play with, with women, but that's, it's irrelevant, you know, who I play with. What's relevant is whether, if you're the Dom, you need to pay very exquisite attention to the submissive mm -hmm. and no, they may, I, I, I could read, usually I can read a submissive and, and take her right up to the spot before she says yellow. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had, uh, you know, yellow, yellow, green, and red are oftentimes the safe words I use. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to hit yellow. I want to get you close. 
and I never want to hit red because in my terms, red means everything stops. We stop, right. no more plague, this is the end of it. I have violated a boundary, or even if I haven't violated a boundary, I've gone too far and I didn't read her well enough. And, and to me, that is that is just a poor, poor skill level on the Dom's part if they take if they violate the boundaries across. Every now and then you're gonna do it. I mean it's it's a rare, but once in a while you're just gonna accidentally hit something you didn't know was there. There's mm -hmm. for example, I I had a um, a submissive that we had we had played and played and she, there were some things she really liked, but I said one word. And it was it was really interesting. Everything was pretty much identical, but I said one word I had never said before in this situation, and it it just exploded with tears. Mm. And and she said red, and we we stopped. Uh, I, I held her for quite a while, and then she started. She, she just exploded with, you know, telling me what ha that had triggered for her. Yeah. It turned out it was very therapeutic. It, it, but it was not intentional. Right. And it was a word it, that we had not negotiated. <laughs> right. It just kind of came out, you know, okay, we're doing this. Uh, I, you know, so there's, you, you never know. You might hit a landmine and not know it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> you will fail. And it's, it's encouraged not to, but, you know, you can't think that you are, um, above not failing. And that's, do you kind of segue into, do you, um, what do your negotiations look like when you, um, are, you know, about to play with a new sub? Well, um, I have some, I've learned, I've learned years ago, and I'm glad I learned this real early on in my BDSM career. I print off or get online and send a link to a, to a contract and to a, to a list. Mm -hmm. And there's some really good lists out there. The best one, <clears throat> the best one I used for years is disappear. It's no longer available, unfortunately. Oh, yeah, I, 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 would, I would ask you to put the link up if I, if it was still going. But what I want to do is, you know, there's, there's some lists. The list I used had 166 different items. Um, and of course, there's, I've seen them with over 250 items. Mm -hmm. But the one I liked was that 166. And the, the two of you independently, well, she's at her house, I'm at my house, I print it out or I or do it online, I check, I like that, one to five scale. Mm -hmm. I hate that, one, five, I love it. You know, those, those kinds of things. Well, when you're finished, you both have got a, a roadmap of what your respective kinks look like. And then you've got also the understanding of what, where they overlap. Right. And if, if they're putting a one on something and I'm putting a five, we're probably never going to do that. <laughs> right. Because that's just off limits. That's going to violate a boundary there. Then the next thing we'll do is literally have a face-to-face -face talk at a coffee shop or something. I usually, I, the only time I would play with somebody I don't know is, is if I was at a party and their dom was there or they had somebody, you know, they're, they're Somebody was there they felt safe about, and they asked me to do something. I would I would be happy to do it, but I want to. I will I will. If I'm in a convention and I'm flogging somebody, the boyfriend or girlfriend will be right there, right? And they'll be reading. Uh, they'll be reading along with me, and mm -hmm. I will be able to whisper to them. Do you want? Do they want more or less? You know, I can. Everybody is every every body, and I mean in the sense of a body, right. <laughs> is different, and no one's going to read all bodies perfectly. So it's it's good to be safe. I want to play with somebody about three times before I really feel like I know enough mm -hmm. about their body to to do what we both want. I mean, it's right. it's a mutual mutual thing. So there's a lot of negotiation and people say, well, that doesn't sound very romantic. And I'd say, well, I didn't get into it for the romance. I right. got into it for the play. And oh, by the way, I've never seen a romantic movie that was nearly as hot as me tying somebody right? up. <laughs> and, you know, whether you whether you fuck afterwards or not, I, I've been to many a place where all we did was was uh, BDSM play. Nobody mm -hmm. had sex. And uh 
I have had many, many times when I played with somebody where we both were satisfied just from the, just from the BDSM play. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but af- afterwards, you know, after the, after the aftercare, after the yeah. person is cooled down and they're feeling relaxed, frequently they want to they want to fuck. You know, yeah. let's go let's go for it. Which connect. I love that too. Yeah, we want to mm-hmm. connect at a different level, and mm-hmm. that's where you're gonna have missionary sex and enjoy mm-hmm. yourself. I don't know. honestly, that's I like that's where I engage most in in like vanilla sex is. Usually after <clears throat> a little bit of BDSM play because yeah. you're go you're on this like wave of adrenaline and then you're coming down from it and you just want to be held and it makes that experience so much more fulfilling for me. Um, mm-hmm. instead of just like, okay, let's fuck to get off. It's like, no, I already got off like mentally <laughs> and I'm dripping and <clears throat> I just need to be, you know, comforted. Yep. yep. Yeah. I love it. Get, uh, and, and that's what I think a lot of doms don't realize is how powerful the orgasm is. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I, I thought, Submissives that I played with over the years say that there's nothing like the orgasm they have while experiencing pain somewhere else, mm-hmm. like on their butt yes. or on their back, spanking somebody or, or flogging them or having nipple clamps on or, you know, there's any number of things that seem to, uh, what the pain seems to do in, in neurological terms, it seems to magnify whatever else is going on. Uh. So you've got the potential excitement and quite frankly, I, I've had subs that can't hardly stand any spanking or flogging until they've had some vibrations on their clip mm-hmm. or they've had a dildo inserted. You get a little bit of stimulation going on uh, vaginally or you're on the clip, then you can, I can just really wallop them on the butt mm-hmm. and they fucking love it. Yeah. But, but you have to warm them up. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, some days they're they're not warm upable. I, I've noticed some submissives, they just aren't getting turned on. So you have mm-hmm. to be careful. You're not going to spank them like you did last week. You may not mm-hmm. even spank them at all because they're just not there. They're, mm-hmm. They've had a hard have a hard day at work, or or the kids are giving them trouble or something, and they can't get their mind off of that. And that's just the mm-hmm. way life is sometimes. Yeah, I've noticed that at, at certain times of my hormonal cycle, I want, you know, different types of touch. Yep. And I just really lean hard into that and listen because it makes my experiences um, more cohesive. And mm-hmm. it just, yeah, it's not always going to be the same. Going back to consent, you can't expect that just because you did it last week or even an hour ago doesn't mean that you can do it again um and that's where your your um empathy empathy comes into play like just as you say Mm. doms need to be self-aware they need to be aware of their uh play partners as well yeah um yeah and the fact is the submissive is always in control yeah some doms don't get that they think no no i'm the dom no you're not in control the submissive at any time could stop everything that's going on. Right. And if, 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 if you don't honor that, then that's, boy, I tell you, get out of that relationship real quick. Oh yeah. Cause no, that's, that's, that's an abuser. That's not a Dom. Yeah. There's a big difference between an abuser and a Dom. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of abuse in BDSM. Um, so that leads me into my ethical question. Uh, where do you find ethics in BDSM and what do they look like for you? Well, I think the the bottom line is mutual uh, mutual pleasure. Mm-hmm. If if the two people are not experiencing something that neither one can give themselves, I mean that's basically what it is. I can jack off anytime I want. She mm-hmm. can probably masturbate anytime she wants. But but what's going on in the interaction in the it's a it's a it's a specific activity. It's a specific stimulation that you can't get any other way, and that's why not just any two people can get together. And I mean, I right. know people. 
I've had some missives that I take them to parties and I'll tell her that guy is an expert in electrical play or that guy really knows fire play. And she says, I don't care how good he is. I don't want to be around him. I, she, uh -huh. I got, you know, I don't have a good feeling about him. Mm -hmm. Whether that, it doesn't mean he's an abuser. It just means she's not attracted maybe, or, or she's afraid of him or she doesn't like the way he, you know. His style um, of play. I mean, there's so yeah, many people yeah, that I have, yeah. even though they are special, they specialize in certain things. I, I've watched them play and it doesn't, their style is not how I like to go about play. And right, right, yeah. yeah, it always, it always causes issues. People get so offended sometimes, you know, I've had this rope top who asked me if I wanted to tie with him. And I was like, you know, I just don't know you well enough. And if we were to have more um, dialogue, then maybe. And then that denial just shut him down. And now every time I see him, it gives me this cold shoulder. And it's just like, um, okay, I mean, I opened the dialogue for us to talk, but you didn't want it. And that kind of speaks for itself as to why I don't want to play with yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and I, like, I like the, I'm sorry, I, I like the connection that comes. If you asked earlier about the ethics, I, I think my, personally, I want a connection with whoever I'm playing yeah. with. I rarely play with somebody once. I, I've done it, I've done it a number of times. But if I'm not interacting with you regularly and we're building a relationship, we're building skills, I mean, I'm getting better and better at doing what I want to do with you. Mm -hmm. And you're getting better and better at interacting with me and learning, you know, what I can do for you. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. it's a give and take thing. Mm -hmm. It's almost like we're speaking a language that's unique to us, just between uh, she and I. I was thinking that too, yeah. like your body is... And the chemicals that are produced are all like a part of this secret language. Yeah, um, it very much is. Yeah. I want to address the um, something that we mentioned earlier about BDSM as therapy. Um, and because I have heard therapists themselves say that it can be a good um, therapeutic method for clients. And one of the, um, examples they used actually was, um, using like a consensual non-consent, uh, scene to help them process a rape, uh, that they encountered, you know, in their past. And I, don't know how I feel about that. Uh, so I, I want to know your thoughts on, on BDSM as therapy. <laughs> mm. I don't think anybody should be doing therapy unless they're trained, <laughs> period. Yeah, absolutely. And even even a trained therapist doing BDSM is trading on thin ice. I, mm -hmm. I do not do BDSM as a substitute for therapy. That's not no. what I do. If I'm playing with somebody, it's for his own self-gratification and their gratification. Mm -hmm. If they need therapy, they need to go talk to somebody else. Now, they should find a kink-friendly therapist mm -hmm. because I, if you're into kink, you're probably not into kink just because of some trauma you experienced. Mm -hmm. But the trauma you experienced at some time in your life is still present and may get expressed in your kink. I have had a number of, of women in this case who, well, now that I think about it, one, one man too, that I knew uh, that I got to know in the kink world, and I didn't necessarily play with them, who, who had been raped, who had been sexually violated, and they found that they could, it helped them deal with it, mm -hmm. being in a, being in a, some kind of scene. I, I have mixed feelings about it because mm -hmm. for one, if, if I'm playing with a submissive who's working some shit out and she, and she didn't tell me. Right. And then, and then I tread on some piece or I trigger something without any knowledge of what's going on that, that kind of sets me up. And I don't, I don't appreciate that. I think that's, 
That's unethical on their part. Mm -hmm. They need to tell me, look, I was raped. I still am working through it. I like to play. I'll take responsibility. Then it then it lets me say, okay, I'll do this or I won't do this. I, right. I have the choice. I had a... Um, without revealing confidences, I'll just say that I had a submissive that w had some pretty massive trauma. Mm -hmm. And uh, sh she did not tell me for like eight or nine months. It was, and we were playing weekly. And uh, one day it, it got triggered somehow. And I mean, I won't go into details. And then I realized I've been playing with fire and didn't even know it. Right. <laughs> now we were able to work through it, negotiate it. I told her, look, really, you need to go get a therapist and work on this. Don't. She said, but you are a therapist. I said, that's not what we're here for. And you never asked permission for you. That wasn't what we were about. Right. So she felt safe. Let's put it this way. She, she knew I was a therapist. She felt safe with me. She felt like she could do what she thought was best. But that still didn't let, it was like non-consensual therapy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. that's not right either. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we had a great relationship after that. We were able to negotiate some things. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure I continued in some ways to help her. But ultimately, she needed to go find a therapist to work through it. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. You know, those are kind of esoteric things. Not everybody's going to come across somebody who's trying to use them as a therapist. Yeah. I mm. have, I, yeah, I think I try to make it a point to, to describe my traumas, not really identify. I, I'm done identifying with my traumas. I'm, I'm more like, this is what happened to me and I don't want you to feel bad for me, but I want to explore this kind of play. Um, or I've had people say that to me and yeah, you get the, you get to decide whether you want to be a part of that cathartic release or not. Right. Um, yeah. I definitely feel like I've had releases, emotional releases in scenes before many times actually. Yeah. Um, and, but it was negotiated beforehand and like there was simple, like a simple example was like, I just had a really rough week and I didn't even know that I was so stressed out. And mm -hmm. I, I did a rope scene with one of my partners and then, and it was like a really, he put me in a lot of like body stress positions. So I was sitting in that space and I was breathing through it. Something that I hadn't been doing the whole week of like oh, all of the stress right. that I was dealing with. I wasn't breathing through mm -hmm. that. So I was in those positions. I was breathing cause I couldn't move, couldn't do anything else except for breathe, accept and move channel. Mm -hmm. And when I came out, I felt 50 times lighter and just, it was just like, I didn't even know that I needed that, but it was so therapeutic mm -hmm. for me in a way. Um, but you know, that um, was with a partner that I felt really comfortable with and we have good communication and all that good stuff. So, well, I'm guessing he's reading you pretty carefully Yeah, and he knew just where to take you and just which, I mean, there's probably a lot of things going on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and he's listened to my week. A lot so. of times it's almost subconscious. You didn't know it and he didn't know it, but he, but between the two of you, you figured it out and that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a beautiful. It can have these really beautiful moments. Yeah. Yeah. After playing with somebody long enough, this happens to me very frequently. If I've played, I don't know, eight, 10 times, I begin good enough reading that I can take people places they've never been before. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that, they may, they may just break down into a sobbing mm -hmm. pile of tears. <laughs> mm -hmm. And of course, from the outside, that it would look like abuse. I mean, somebody would say, wow, look, he made her cry. Mm -hmm. No, the crying was a release of incredible tension that was coming mm -hmm. from somewhere else. Um, there's several times I've seen this too. I've seen it way too often. It it's just 
It's just, it is cathartic, like you say, Margot. It's, it's absolutely beautiful when it happens. I, it's not something I can plan or even they mm -hmm. plan. Mm -hmm. You didn't plan this. He didn't plan that. But when it happens, it's, it's just gorgeous. It's, mm -hmm. it's un, undescribable. I know. Where else, where, where else in life does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> it makes me so happy. Yeah. Yeah. It is this third dimension that we're playing around in, um, that emotional release through our, you know, expression of sexuality. Exactly. Mm, I love it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, well, this is a delightful conversation. I, I haven't know. had this conversation in a while with uh, with anybody, so I'm I'm happy we're having this. <laughs> yeah, me too. Thanks for opening up your world to us. Um, you There's know, one maybe, other little piece. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, and then and then I want you to finish it off. But what are some of the major differences you've seen? uh in the lifestyle that from when you first came into it to about now because it's i mean since 50 shades of gray it's gotten so much more exposure and i feel like there's a lot more like fake doms out there stuff like that but just from your point of view like what you know what have what have you seen evolve and or devolve uh yeah, that's a good question. I have seen, I've seen both good and bad happening. The good is more and more people are coming out. More and more people being honest about it. More people are being exploring. There's more conferences. There have been back mm -hmm. in the two thousand. They exploded. There was conferences everywhere. And uh, to parallel that, there were good books coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, there were books that were. Uh, you know, screw the roses, give me the thorns came out uh, around 1999, I think. And then you got the loving Dom came out and mm -hmm. then you got the polyamory uh, uh, loving more and, uh, and um, uh, the ethical slut mm -hmm. uh, uh, and almost all of the polyamory stuff deals with BDSM stuff too. Mm -hmm. They almost always have a chapter or two on it because the two seem to overlap so much. So that was that's all been good. I think there's been uh, an acceptance in our uh, in our culture of the naturalness of of kink, and it's not vilified. It's not a satanic practice. It's not any of that bullshit anymore. So all that's all that is good. However, on the other side, and you kind of already mentioned this, and it's a pet peeve of mine. There's a lot of people getting into it that are uneducated and mm -hmm. don't give a shit to learn. So they they go into it with, with no information, with no understanding, with no self-awareness. They think, oh good, I get to beat somebody's butt. Or, oh good, I get to be totally submissive to somebody and let mm -hmm. them abuse me. And it's it can lead to, it can lead to trauma. It can lead to abuse. It can lead to really bad uh, practices that really benefit no one. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that you got an asshole who's beating somebody's butt doesn't make him any better, uh, no matter whether that person likes it or not. He may be expressing misogynistic behaviors mm -hmm. and treating someone uh, in a way that he should be working out with a therapist. You know, mm -hmm. I hate my mother. I want to beat my mother. Okay, I'll beat you instead. Oh, well, maybe you ought to go talk to a therapist about this instead of that. <laughs> there's yeah, and there's another another piece that is very irritating uh, because it's it's not irritating to me as much as it is to submissives, male and female submissives. There are lots of people out there who want a good dom. They want somebody who does everything you and I've been talking about here today. And when they find somebody that says, oh yeah, I'm a dom. Oh yeah, I can do that. Oh yeah, I've read that book. Well, they get into the relationship a little bit and they find out either they don't know what the fuck they're talking about or they've mm -hmm. never done it before or they're not willing to learn. They make mistakes and want to apologize. Or worse yet, they're really a switch or they're a sub and they wanted to trick you into being a dom for them. Mm-hmm. 
over yeah. and over again, I see guys saying, I'm a dom, they get in a relationship. After about three or four dates or scenes, they say, why don't you tie me up? Yeah. What, with and they were lying their whole, they were <laughs> lying their asses off the whole time. They weren't true doms. And even if they were switches, there's nothing wrong with being a switch. It's just be honest about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and honesty is so critical. Good communication and honesty, so critical in BDSM mm -hmm. in, in the kink world. So my pet peeve, I'll just repeat it, is people who say they're doms and they're really switches or mm -hmm. say they're doms and they really want somebody to dom them. It's just so dishonest. Yeah. And it uh, pisses me off. I've seen yeah. way too much of that. It's kind of like similar to someone being like, oh, I'm poly and then getting into a relationship and being like, no, like, I just want you to be sexually exclusive to me. And you're just like, well, yep, I've seen that a lot, yep. too. Oh, that that I've seen people use poly to trick people into a relationship and do exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. It's so it's so dishonest and mm -hmm. it's all predicated on the monogamous model that we carry around in our heads, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. but there, there is one other piece I want to make sure we talk about, and that's <clears throat> early on we talked about where do kinks come from. Mm -hmm. and, and there's lots of evidence that they come from the things we talked about earlier. However, we all have fantasies from very early on. I mean, whether we're fantasizing about some cartoon character or something, it's still a fantasy. It may not even be sexual, but we have fantasies. As children have fantasies all the time. And we we hear children in their rooms playing with their toys and they're having fantasies about what those toys are doing. But all of that's okay. And we realize that's the way human brain works. That fantasy is just a part of who we are. We're very curious. We want to we want to explore the world. We want to explore our fantasy worlds inside. But as you get older and you're hormones start kicking in, your sexuality starts developing in your body, your fantasies can start changing mm -hmm. into, and, and you start exploring fantasies. In fact, fantasies are the way you try to figure out, you know, what do I like? What do I not like? Mm -hmm. And, but that's only one purpose. Other things fantasies do is help explore, ex help you explore, not what you like and don't like, but what you want to enjoy inside your own brain, but would never do outside of your own brain. Right. When I there is porn that I like watching, but I would never want to do it with a human being, period. Mm -hmm. It's just it's not attractive to me. And yet I can get off on that porn. So what I'd like to explore or at least emphasize in, in what we're doing right now, Margo, is that it's OK that you have crazy fantasies. It's OK that you have fantasies about shit that's wrong or illegal. We all do. It's mm -hmm. not unusual. I mean, <laughs> I've had a couple bosses. I had fantasies about killing. <laughs> <laughs> Triangle had boss. <laughs> and, and none of us would say, oh, that's wrong, Daryl. You shouldn't fantasize about killing your boss. Well, I, I don't find it a pleasant activity. I don't want to have a boss that I hate that much. Mm -hmm. But we all do have fantasies of stuff that would be illegal if we did it. But as long as we're not acting on it, as long as we're just masturbating, thinking about mm -hmm. it, that we're okay with that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think people get scared of their own fantasies sometimes. Mm -hmm. I, and once we separate what is reality and what is fantasy, do you want me to beat your butt in this manner that I thought up in my mind that I had a fantasy about? I have fantasy about beating your butt this particular way or whipping you or tying you up. Mm -hmm. I could have that kind of fantasy and then I could find a partner that wants to perform with me in that scene. That's okay. It, there we're taking a fantasy and translating it into a temporary reality for the two of us. Yeah. But after that, uh, when the scene is over, you know, we do whatever else we want. We fuck or we go to have coffee or something. <laughs> but the fantasy has been, some part of the fantasy has been fulfilled. Right. There may be a part of the fantasy I never fulfill. I'd, I'd like to do something else, but you don't want to do it. And uh, so it never gets done. Uh -huh. So anyway, no, I like reality. That. that's important. I have a checklist that I go through with anyone that I'm going to play with. And there's a whole section of uh, like have, you know, ha like 
do you want to experience this or have you experienced this as a fantasy versus do you want to experience this in play? So I get to see what they have fantasized about, but wouldn't necessarily Mm. act out and do a little bit more um, psychological play with them. Maybe tease them about it, bring it up if it's something that they you know, I mean, and I, that's so important to stress is because we do have all of these fantasies and I have things that I would want someone to threaten me with, but I would never want them to go through with it. But, right, right. you know, it's, it's fun playing on that line, you know? Yeah, a- absolutely is fun. And, and you, like you said, you probably would never do it in real life. Wouldn't even be fun in real life. Right. But, but, the interchange between you and your partner. I, I, I do that a lot. I've, I've done that for years. I started that way back when I was in my 30s. And I thought, this is really interesting. When two people are fucking and talking and engaging each other in their mutual fantasies, mm-hmm. that is so damn, that's such a turn That's awesome. Yeah. And yet we say shit to each other or fantasize stuff Neither one of us would even come close to doing in real life. Mm -hmm. But we're talking to each other and it's turning each other on. And I know what turns her on. And I use that fantasy to get her going. Right. And maybe even to have an orgasm. Mm -hmm. And she may reciprocate by by jumping into a fantasy that she knows that I like. And then we she plays it on me until, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just such. And that's not even BDSM, Margot. That's just good communication. That's mm-hmm. <laughs> just enjoying each other's minds. Right. I was going to say, the mind is where it all happens. Absolutely. You know. It's, it's the most erogenous zone in our body <laughs> is, our, is our minds. And it's so fun once you get over, once you understand that sex is play. Yeah. And, and then you approach sex as play. Mm-hmm. You can relax. I so many people I get that I've done sex therapy with of some one sort or another over the years, and they just can't relax. So we actually have to do things like practice playing at sex. Yeah. Put a role play on, you know, do something that takes you out of your body and gives you a role to play and and experiment with that. There's yeah. there's all sorts of things you can do to learn to relax. Well, I love it. I we need yeah. a whole book on that. <laughs> 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 yeah, we do. It's just like step out, do it. Just experience yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. I had, I had a partner who just loved uh pirate pirate kind of fantasies. Ooh, interesting. <laughs> And she would act, we would act some of these pirate fantasies out. But when she was in pirate mode, and she wasn't the pirate, she was the kidnapped victim. Uh-huh. And, and so so I would be the pirate who's <laughs> kidnapped her and put her on the ship and tied her up. And uh, she really got off on that. I love and she, it. We would have better sex after a pirate fantasy than almost <laughs> anything else we did. <laughs> And I'm not even into that shit. I'm not. I mean, pirate fantasy. Okay, I'll do it. But <laughs> harmless, harmless. Yeah, that's awesome. Was, yeah. I love it. It can get wild, and it's just liberating, and it makes life a little bit more entertaining. You know. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, thank you. Any last comments? Uh, well, before we yeah, close I out? would like to people to go look up my books i think that our discussion day might be informed if somebody better informed if they read my book sex mm-hmm. and god mm-hmm. how religion distorts sexuality because uh, i talk about kinks i talk about some of the biology some of the cultural stuff that we've already talked about here and beyond that though if you're interested in kink per se there's a number of good books out there that i, I would encourage you to read them and if you have a partner, read them together. Mm-hmm. Take both of you, read the same book. Read, you know, Screw the Roses, Give Me the Thorns, or, or uh, More Than Two, or, or you know, yeah. in any one of those books. But read them together and understand what you're trying to accomplish and what your various interests and kinks are. Mm-hmm. And there's another little thing that I think really want to encourage people to do, and that is go get a contract mm-hmm. uh, and print out a, a kink contract. I use contract off and on for years. I don't necessarily use them now, but 
They're such a good way to start a relationship. And then use the checklist that we've talked about. They're such a good way to negotiate. They make sure you don't leave anything out. Mm -hmm. And you really learn a lot about the other person. And it opens you up. It gives you an opportunity to say, admit maybe for the first time, I really like this kind of of thing. Mm -hmm. And I fantasized all my life. I'd like to try and acting it out, see if Mm -hmm. I really like it in real life. So there's so much you can do with what we've discussed here today, Margot. I just want to say thank you for letting us have this opportunity. This is great. (laughs) Uh, I don't get to talk about, this is such a passion of mine. I've I've loved this stuff for years. Oh, well, I'm so glad you were open to talking about it. This is huge for me. And I, you know, I'm still new in all of it. So I love hearing well-established lifestylers talk about their experiences. So it means a lot. Okay. Thanks for having me. And this concludes our four-part series with Dr. Daryl Ray, Religious Trauma Specialist. I hope you all thoroughly enjoyed today's conversation. Um, There are so many resources out there, and I'm going to post some in the bio and link below. So go ahead and check those resources out if you're curious about stepping into your third dimension in the BDSM world. And I hope to see you guys next time. Thanks for joining. Music is Face In It by Fallen for Autumn on Instagram. Go give her some love. I'll see you guys next time. I want you to touch my body. Let's get it. Now you wrap your hands around my waist. And bury your first thing around when you touch.